order, April 22nd, 2019. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the So we have four things on our agenda tonight. The first thing is a presentation by Mr. Kevin Kays. How to. Um, just for your perusal. Entrance is made. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Good evening, uh, Director. So, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present to you. Uh, there's a lot of materials there, uh, many pieces to the puzzle. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, I can put the numbers for you. Uh, in grants, uh, Mayor Wenzel in the class of 1963, Scranton Central, class of 1963, uh, donated $4,000. The Lackawanna Heritage, Heritage Valley Authority, $500. K&T Networks, that's my nephew, uh, he uh, gave me a check for $1,000 when I visited him for Christmas a couple years ago. Uh, Penny's Federal Credit Union, $2,500. Um, the Waymark Wind uh, Farm up there, LLC, they donated $1,000. PPL donated $2,000. So $11,000 in grants. And the students, through their hard work and fundraising, have raised uh, $5,333.92 to contribute to this. And then we have um, donated services for the concrete bore, the building of the rebar, the sauna tube, uh, the electrical conduit and electrical wiring, uh, all of that uh, donated probably about $13,000 worth of donated services and uh, materials. Uh, the turbine is a, uh, they call it a Skystream 3.7 turbine. It is the turbine that has been adopted by uh, Wind for Schools, it's a national program. Uh, Kid, Kid Wind is involved, uh, this curricula uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, paired with STEM. Uh, the turbine will generate uh, at peak 2.4 kilowatts. Uh, the, it's a small turbine uh, compared to what's being used here on campus, uh, you know, generate a small amount of electricity. Uh, probably the savings will be somewhere between $400 and $600 a year. Um, it's more of a uh, learning tool, a educational tool uh, to be used where the students can do all kinds of calculations. It has a transmitter uh, in the top of the nacelle that transmits the data of you know, the actual energy being produced uh, in real time. That data uh, will be sent to a national register in Kansas where all of the data for wind, genera you know, uh, wind uh, electricity being generated in the United States is kept. Uh, the students can be involved with that transmission as well. Uh, Susan Stewart is a uh, Professor of Engineering, Aerospace Engineering, at Penn State, uh, the main campus. She heads uh, Pennsylvania Win for, uh, Win for Schools. She was very helpful in the process along the way, helping uh, you know, point us in the right direction for funding. And um, She will donate a uh, Raspberry Pi, a small computer, that can be dedicated to the project. Um, 
we're hoping that you know it, it needs a straight line site from the nacelle of the turbine, which is uh, planned to be put uh, just inside the stadium gates near the scoreboard, between the scoreboard and the ticket booth there. So it needs straight line sight from there to the computer, so I'm, I'm wondering if maybe the library might be a good spot for that, uh, where there's a window, you know, that straight line uh, there. And um, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, plan is, uh, uh, Quandell is involved as well, I think Phil to mention Quandell, they're bringing the concrete the plan is to drill or auger the hole. It's a three foot diameter uh, hole that's 10 feet deep. Um, it uh, will uh, be fitted with a bolt kit that sits in the top of the cement and it'll take 28 days to cure before it's ready to hold the pole. And when the, there are two um, engineers, I'm told that the best in Northeast, Northeast Pennsylvania won a structural engineer who um, drew up the drawing for the foundation for us and uh, has his stamp is on that um, and an electrical engineer who drew up the electrical um, the structural engineer says that I asked him you know that thing's going to be catching wind it's going to be a little top heavy he said um, that foundation will hold anything so, um, Northeast uh, Inspection Consultants have reviewed the engineer's drawings and they have been approved. Uh, our city um, uh, zoning officer has approved the zoning for it. Um, all of the pieces are in place. Uh, there's, you know, um, I don't think there's anything we've missed. We've been over it. Uh, so many times, lots of lots of pieces of the puzzle. So many members of the community have come together, um, donating their donating their time, their talent, and their treasure to see this this happen. Uh, the students are really excited about it, and I'm asking that you know if this generates electricity that saves the district anywhere from four to six hundred dollars, that that money be dedicated to a fund to fuel projects from year to year to be the seed money for additional projects that environmental science students here at Scranton High, whoever the teacher may be, um, may be able to use those monies to be, you know, to, to fuel it. But most of the projects that I've been involved with here, uh, all of them I should say, were, were fueled with a, a $500 grant from the Lackawanna Heritage Valley Authority, the rain garden we put on the, the solar panels that are on the roof. Um, and this project as well uh, started uh, with that. And uh, so I, all I'm asking is that since, you know, the district, it's not, not going to cost the district anything. Um, I'm just asking that those, those monies that are saved, which we can monitor, we can, you know, uh, provide that, that data, uh, asking that that be uh, put into a fund for future projects. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You have. Mr. Case, do you, sure. do you think that we could um, duplicate this at other campuses uh, around the district? Well, uh, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because it's something I meant to talk about a little about. Uh, in, in, so it depends on the wind. Um, my experience here was I've been watching the flags out these front windows for a long time. Uh, and 80% of the time you look out there, they're blowing straight out. There are times when there's nothing, but you know, I thought, gee, I wonder what the actual data shows. And uh, Susan Stewart was able to provide that for us. Um, we've got an average wind speed of about seven miles per hour, which is enough to turn this turbine and, uh, and, and, and get good uh, results from it. It really depends on, like, we're in a valley. Typically, wind turbines don't do well in a valley, but we have good wind here. It comes over this one ridge here in between the gap there and funnels right through the stadium grandstands. Uh, so uh, it, you would have to look at the data, you know, get the data for the individual locations. So currently, there's just one that's going to go in uh, Scranton High? That's right. And do you, uh, 
based on what you've seen and worked with so far, do you think that there's room for more here? Oh, uh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a possibility. There's, uh, depending on where you want to put them. You know, uh, when uh, Susan Stewart came up from Penn State one Saturday in January, we walked her on and our coats were cold by the end of it. Uh, we walked her on and, and tried to figure out the best sighting uh, for it. Uh, there are a number of places that are really good. There are a number of places that aren't so good. The closer you get to the building, uh, you know, the wind diminishes. These flags at the, in the front of the building here will be drooping when the other ones are straight out sometimes, dipping on the wind direction. So, uh, but certainly there are places, uh, yeah, you could put others in here. Thanks for your information. This is, this is wonderful. I mean, again, it's you know, it's a small amount of it's not a it's not a great uh, generator of electricity. It's more a teaching tool than anything else. The uh, one of the grant tours we visit with the community connections to our watershed uh, student forum. There's about 12 districts in Lackawanna County involved. We visit the Waymart Wind Farm every year. We put the helmets on in case a bird gets hit. And a bird comes down. You have a uh, they, they donated $1,000. They are, um, you know, those turbines, about $2 million turbines, they pay for themselves within five to eight years. And each one of those is generating elect enough electricity to power four or 500 homes. So there's 46 turbines up there, so they figure about close to 23,000 homes are being powered by those turbines up there. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, Global warming, which may or may not be a hoax, you know, according to what you see in the news. Um, my stance is uh, not. Good. Having looked at the IPCC reports, uh, we have to do something. Um, and this generation deserves that we do something. So uh, I think it's a good example. Uh, any other questions? I'd be happy to answer. Okay, so uh, there's curriculum written for uh, six, grades 6 through 12, so anyone can come on campus here and, and make use of it. And, uh, you know, uh, the folder has just a couple of lesson plans that are part of that, part of the curriculum that's involved with this. Um, it's, from, you know, my take on it, it looks like uh, a great thing for all those, you know, all those grades 6 through 8. So. Um, you know. So that was my question. Sure. Um, so intermediate schools could come over and actually get a hands-on lesson with sure. this and be exposed absolutely. to this and work yeah. Teacher. with the high school students as well? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Case, I, I just want to say this is a great integrated project that will fuel future integrated projects. Um, great job. We hope so. Oh, thank, thank you, Dr. Okay. Yeah. And I'd like Thank you for bringing it to a total explanation. I know you've brought it up in some of your speeches when you come up and talk and, and were timed. So I, I think I speak on behalf of all the board that it, it's nice to see something so creative being done and giving our students a hands-on opportunity and a real life experience. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure, really. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, next we have uh, Mrs. Sandra Miller, she's from PA Schools Work. PA Schools Work is uh, something that's going on at a state level, kind of similar to what we're doing right now. We're going to have her give a presentation about PA Schools Work.
was a wonderful project. I'm a school director in another pro in another school district, so I'm always interested in, in, in hearing what other schools do. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. I'm so excited to be here. Um, um, my name is Sandra Miller. As I stated, I'm a school director at another uh, school district down in the Lehigh Valley. Um, but I came involved um, with school funding a number of years ago for the Campaign for Fair Education Funding. Um, this program now, PA Schools Work, is the successor of that program. And uh, we are working on trying to increase the amount of funding that the Commonwealth provides to all of our 500 school districts. Um, I'll just give you a, a little bit of brief background. The Campaign for Fair Education funding was the first type of a co uh, coalition that had been formed trying to raise awareness about funding. We worked very closely with the commission to get a basic education funding formula in place. And that became um, a factor of all of our lives now since 2016. Um, this program now is looking at adequacy. Is it going to work? Yes. Um, the coalition um, includes a wide variety of partners. All of the associations, PSEA, uh, the principals association superintendents, as well as the school board directors, as well as a lot of child advocates. I'm sure you can read some of the icons. It's a broad-based support. People care about education in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we believe that using um, a broad-based approach, having businesses as well as child advocates, as well as education um, advocates working together, while well, we can be more successful. The goals of PA Schools work, as I had mentioned, the campaign was basically trying to come up with a funding formula, um, uh, and it was focused on basic education. We now are looking at um, equity, but also adequacy, and we're looking at all three components, basic education, special education, and career and technical education. I'm going to go through these slides quickly. If anyone wants a copy, they will be available. The PA schools work um, then decided to come out this year with the, we rolled out in November of 2018. Uh, we requested from the governor's office a very large ask. We believe the basic um, education funding line needs to be increased by $3.7 billion. Um, and the only way to achieve that, to provide adequate funding to all our schools, is to start. So we asked for $400 million for basic education, 100 for special ed, and uh, 10 for career and technical. Education remains a priority um, for the governors, but he didn't quite come through for us. Um, $200 million is the actual uh, increase that will come through um, for basic education funding. Special ed, he came in with 50 and 10 million, but with a caveat for the career and technical. I'm going to just give some background information on the budget and so what you know is happening. It's hard to do both. Um, the $200 million increase. Um, it, it says that it's 400 million, 240 million is the ready to uh, learn block grants, which is another component. But of the 200 million, um, there is some base allocations. Scranton was one of the school districts that were fortunate to receive um, a, a boost in their baseline allocation last year. And this year, um, they're recommending that becomes a permanent part of your uh, allocation so that you will, is, it was considered a one-time allocation, they want to make that permanent as well as for those other districts. They also want to include a salary a boost for minimum for teachers and that covers the expenditures to raise that up for the small uh, percentages of school um, districts that receive it. I think it's something close to only like 180 districts. It's not a lot of districts but it's a very meaningful step in the right direction in addressing um, teacher salaries. And the last, you will see, um, it actually ends up being 166 million, will go through the funding formula. So I wanted to get just a graphic of what the funding formula is. I, I was hoping it was a big enough picture. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with what the funding formula does. 
but it now recognizes the actual population of your school district. So it looks at what your student population is and it looks at the community that your students live in. So you have your total um, number of students that you have in your district. And then they look at something that's called acute poverty and standard poverty. That acute poverty is the individuals that are 99% and below of the federal poverty level. And then regular poverty goes to 180. You get extra points, I guess you can consider it. You get a 0.6 additional percentage for all your students that fall into that category, and then an additional 0.3 if they fall in the um, a moderate poverty. And then they have a, con a, a whole section of the formula that's called concentrated poverty. And Scran qualifies as a concentrated poverty. That means 30% of your population, based on the census survey, says that you have um, poverty in your school district. And you do exceed that number, so you get an additional percentage on top of that. That then also includes your language. In, um, is, this is an older slide. Um, so they, they change it every, I think, year from ELL to LVP. I think they're now using uh, EDL. For, um, every time I turn around, ESSA has a new role. But that, um, they do give you a, a extra because they believe that it takes extra resources to deal with individuals that does, that do, um, does not have English as their primary language. And then they also uh, do recognize the, uh, if you have a large population for charter schools. So you do get a small percentage for that. And then you actually get a weighted student headcount. And then that gets added to what your district looks like. And that's the effort that your district has in raising taxes and also your um, poverty level, your median household income. I'm not going to go through the details on this, but this formula benefits school districts like Scranton. It recognizes your changing population. It recognizes the tax effort of your district, and it recognizes the poverty or the median household income that exists where your students and all of you live. So this funding formula is important because we now have more and more money going through this formula. It, we have a base year. Um, I know that the individuals were concerned when the formula first came out. There are several districts, even here in the Northeast, but about two-thirds of the district, if 100% of the money goes through the formula, they would lose substantial amount of money and would not be able to survive. So what they came up with was a base year, and the base year is the, the amount of money you received in 2015. So you can see, see the very first, you know, they have 2018 here, and $450 million went through that year. This just gives you an idea of how that has grown. The year that we're currently in, the 2020, is 705. That's what we're currently looking at. And that at 705 um, is about 12%, uh, just shy of 12% of the money for basic education goes through the formula. So it's slowly moving and directing money into districts that have greater need, because the formula recognizes greater need. And then that last is the actual, um, what it would look like if the governor's budget goes into play. So you'll see that middle section, the minimum salaries there, they're ready to learn, and then the adjustment to the base, which is the money that was provided to the school districts that were considered distressed last year. But that's all gonna be now as adjustments to base in the future, so the base actually will, be ri will rise to a different level than the 2015 level but um, $855 million will go through the formula. We believe in the formula. We believe the formula addresses the concerns for communities because it addresses tax effort, but it also really recognizes what happens in the school district based on this population. But a lot more money must go through this. We need to have millions and millions of dollars added for each school district. And the only way to do that is if billions of dollars go through. Just want to quickly go through these next slides. Um, special education funding is important for your school district, so you would like to be interested in this. Uh, $50 million increase is important. Um, it is through the funding formula. A similar formula was put into place right prior to basic ed. Um, and I just, the increase though is only $72 million since 2008. The graphic I'm going to show you now is shows the difference for that. Oh, I thought that was next. Did I miss a, huh? Sorry about that. 
This is the first time I've used this PowerPoint. Um, for career and tech ed, even though $10 million is listed in the governor's budget, it doesn't go through the subsidies. It doesn't come to the districts. It's going to be through a special program. So we're working very hard to have that money redirected into the actual subsidy line so that it goes down to the student level and into the student, uh, into the schools. So this is what I'm all about. What do we need to do in order to provide more funding for our schools? Uh, we believe working together as a concerted effort, um, all of these types of rallies and the activities that we have planned. We believe that the lawmakers' choices in Harrisburg is instrumental in the success of our program. Uh, we believe that all conversations that we have regarding funding, and these wonderful people had an opportunity to speak to um, some of the representatives. You have very supportive representatives here um, that are out there battling for your district on a regular basis. But we actually need a united voice for all of the Northeast schools. And I would like to see all of the school districts working together to do the kind of things that you guys are trying to do here to really make a change in Harrisburg. In order to assist with this process, um, the uh, PA schools work is a base, uh, is very research based. Uh, we have a number of in information that's available to you. If you go to paschoolsworks.org, there's a specific a fact sheet just for Scranton. And it will give you information such as your poverty level. It will tell you how much money per uh, student spending that you are compared to other school districts. It will give you an idea of what your increase in special ed and what your charter school activity is. And that information is all supported. So when you go and meet with your legislators, we're able to provide you the support for that. We also um, did a specific tax presentation, and then we have that available uh, to give to districts. They can show that during their finance committee. And it shows individuals what happens when the state does not participate sufficiently in funding our schools. It results in local communities having to raise their taxes and putting a burden on their community instead of providing the amount of money that they need to provide for our students. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Miller. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Mrs. Miller? Two things. Two things I wanted to finish up with. Um, These are the fact sheets that give you some information that is just about the overall statewide campaign. Um, this information is important if you want to talk to people. We are dismal when it comes to comparing us against the rest of the country. Um, when you're talking 47th um, in the country, we have the largest disparity between richest and poorest school district on spending. So this information is helpful. And we have uh, a set of postcards that were set up. Um, we are asking school uh, advocates to mail these to their legislators. It just reminds them about how important it is to invest in our schools. Um, we've had them sent all across the Commonwealth um, to all the legislators, from their senators to your representatives. And we want them to start thinking about PA schools work. You guys all do an excellent job. Uh, we provide a wonderful education. And we are remarkably successful in Pennsylvania. Um, a number of people will provide research about how well we're doing. Um, and that's usually on the back of our local communities. Um, and we believe it's time for the Commonwealth to participate more fully. All right, so that's... Excuse me, Sandra, sure. could you remind them of, of your very informative Facebook page? Uh, the PA Schools Work? Yes, paschoolswork.org. Um, okay. You can go on that website. Um, it also, there's also on Facebook. And we run constant social media graphics. I also encourage, if you're on Twitter, I know a lot of educators are on Twitter, um, if, and you follow us, it, we um, conti continuously are pushing out information and graphics about the wonderful things that happen in our school district, but also what happens when there isn't sufficient funding. So we do talk about both sides of the story. We try to be positive, but we also provide some really um, interesting um, facts about what happens at a school district um, that they can't drink their water or um, they have to close down sections of their building because of mold. 
um, to the wonderful things that schools are able to do when they have sufficient funding such as STEM and, um, and successful graduation rates. But it's paschoolswork.org. Um, I have buttons and pens that will remind you of it. I will have those for you so when you leave, you can have it. And you, every time you sign your name in the next week, it'll remind you to go on and join the work, we call it, um, and hit that uh, icon, and it'll provide you with regular updates. Um, obviously, we were um, unhappy, I guess is the word. I have been trying to find the, the right word. We were not discouraged because the governor did put money um, for the first time. 166 million actually results in money getting into uh, individual schools' coffers. It doesn't just go to cover your mandated expenditures, so it actually will result in some money hitting into some of the school districts. Um, but there are 16 school districts that um, did not receive any additional funds. They actually received less money than they received the year before. That's what happens when you don't put enough money through the formula, and that's what happens when the Commonwealth doesn't participate enough in raising funds for our districts. Any I have one more questions? Thing. I have one more thing. Um, yes, sir. A few PTA members uh, asked me, because I mentioned that you have templates for letters, letters to the editor, letters to legislators. Yes. Um, how can they get access to them? You have them. I have them right here. Great. So, <laughs> can you explain that too, that these are available, how they're used, why they're used? So there's a, uh, we, have a, we had an advocacy uh, toolkit and an advocacy, advocacy calendar, and I didn't go through all of those details, but they're all on the website and I have spoken about them. I do have copies if you are interested, um, but we do provide in our toolkit um, some language um, that you can use to write a letter to the editor. Um, we're looking for broad-based support, and we're also always looking for op-eds as well if you want to write a longer piece. But if you regularly have members of your community out there um, beating the drum, saying it's important that we raise money for our schools, it's important that we look at it, and if you need help, PA Schools Works will provide you with the language. Um, if you don't even want to go that far, send me an email. Um, my cards are available, um, and we will write it, and all you have to do is sign your name. I've done that for more than enough people. Um, in fact, they often write for me now. I just did an op-ed, and I signed it, and it went out under my name, and I, it, I did not write it. Um, and I felt very proud of how I, smart I sounded, but it was wonderful when you have communication experts that are willing to support all of us, and um, we will do that for you. It is important that we really raise awareness, and it's just not the same individuals that are sitting at this table, the superintendents and the school directors. We need the teachers, we need the parents, we need the grandparents, we need the business leaders who are saying that they do not have individuals to fill their jobs. We need everybody to come together to be supportive of our schools in order for us to be successful. And I know that uh, you hear people talk about how important workforce development is, and this is an excellent way to lead that conversation down to providing better funding for our students. Yes, sir. <laughs> What is our biggest concern in getting enough allocation? We, um, what's been happening? Uh, yeah, thus, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest thing that you're running into? Correct. That, uh, the biggest obstacle right now politically is whether or not we've been successful in getting the governor to ask for more money. Um, the structural deficit has been um, sufficient <laughs> that um, he had unsuccessful um, efforts to raise taxes. So at this stage, he's trying to maintain increases to education without going out on a, for a large revenue ask. And I think that's our biggest deterrent. Um, and I think that uh, PA Schools Work does not provide how to raise the money. We just want a reoccurring, sustainable amount of money dedicated to our schools and to our students. And we believe that when, we, when we've spoken to legislators after the governor's ask, um, they were not interested in going higher than what the governor put out there. So until the tide turns where people believe that raising taxes um, to support our schools is the way to go, um, I think that's, that's probably the biggest deterrent. And, and unfortunately, there's still a few people that think uh, um, in Harrisburg that the lawsuit 
Um, there is a funding lawsuit. I'm not sure how familiar you are. Um, a number of school districts filed a lawsuit. Um, I don't think it's great. 2014. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think Scranton is one of the. There is, I, I used to know all of them. I thought, oh my gosh, if I messed that up, I would be, yes. But it, the, the number of school districts that filed the lawsuit, and it actually um, is the first time being successful that they're actually going to hear the case. And they're, But that's still going to be years away, and we cannot rely on the courts to tell our legislators the right thing to do. So it's up to us to make sure that we talk to them and get them to come and raise the, the funds that we need. Any further questions? I'll be here um, for the rest of the meeting, so if you want to speak to me afterwards, please do so. And we'll also have a discussion at the end of this as soon as we're finished to try to get ideas and um, have a little bit of interaction, interaction between the, the crowd and the board and everyone that's involved here as a stakeholder. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as an organization, we are supported by, I heard people talking about going to Harrisburg. Um, we have a number of uh, organizations like down in the southeast corner. They have days that they're going into Harrisburg. Um, I know that the northeast corner, um, we're working with uh, PA Schools Work has an actual committee just in northeast PA. Uh, we've met uh, twice now at the Luzerne IU, so you can join the committee and, and start participating. You've had some real good participants so far um, from uh, uh, your school district here as well as some of the other districts and we would love to have you and those are types of things that we would support you in your efforts. And here's your part. Right. Thank you very much. Okay I'm a little bit of a walker too. Thank you very much everybody for coming up and uh, taking the time out of your day to uh, come together to listen to this presentation that we have uh, this evening. What we're here to talk about tonight is fair funding and how it affects our district in particular. Uh, there's a lot of districts that are being affected by this as uh, Sandra had made uh, very apparent before, but I wanted to talk about specifically how it impacts the Scranton School District. Uh, firstly, if you could go to the first slide here, I'm gonna try to see if that works. I'd like to talk about our population growth over the past five years. I think this is extremely important because over the past five years, we've had 9,598 students. We now have 10,167 as of March 7th of this year. Uh, the reason I think that's important is because we're here trying to talk about ways to fund our districts and ways to make sure that our district stays afloat during this difficult time. And a lot of the things that have been brought up by um, Dr. Finan, who's also here, we appreciate all of her efforts, have been things that have been talking about potentially. Uh, and what could happen with regard to retraction of districts and closing of schools. It just kind of is an important note, I think, to make that our schools have grown, and not substantially, but we've grown probably about 600 kids in maybe five years. That's enough that can probably fill any elementary school that we have. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is our local tax effort. So Sanders talked about that very briefly, and talked about how what we pay as a district compared to what other people pay. There's 500 districts in the state of Pennsylvania. We are 171st when we, when we talk about our local tax effort. So that means the amount of mills that we've raised on our residents is better than all but 171. There are hundreds that don't do as much as we do. However, on an urban school district level, you'll note that we get much less than any other urban school district anywhere near our size. Uh, please uh, forgive me, this slide's a little bit uh, Scattered, I've never seen it like that, but what we talk about is basically the uh, eight biggest school districts in Pennsylvania. And the eight districts are Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Allentown, Erie, Reading, Scranton, and then there's two other there, York and, York and Harrisburg underneath. And this slide basically shows the city's increase and decrease in population. No one's really increasing or decreasing that much in population, however, uh, we are increasing. This, the population of the city is increasing. It's not decreasing. And that's shown by uh, the amount of kids coming into our schools every single day. The next slide is one we're going to sit and talk about for a little while. This is the one that I think is the most frustrating to me. Uh, you look at this slide shows first the three-year average daily membership. And as we've gone through, I've been asked a little bit about where did you get some of this information and how to come up. Um, a lot of this information was directly gotten from uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education and uh, another group that's uh, Pennsylvania Education Voters. Uh, the school 
district uh, teachers have looked this over. Uh, I've got some of the information from Sarah Holfies Hall, who's been a, a great partner in all, in all of this and actually got me onto this. I have to say that everywhere I go. She's the one who taught me uh, about this about three years ago. It's the reason that I really started the fight for it. But you look at a three-year average daily membership, ADM, we have 9,971 students. Uh, what we're trying to do here is take a look at the basic education funding line item in the budget that the governor's office has. So this isn't all of the state budget money that we get. We do get a lot for PEASERS and other things like that, but so, do we, so does every other district. And I think that that's sometimes uh, given at a slightly unfair level. That's another PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> However, I think this, this, I'd like to draw attention to York. Uh, York has 7,947 students, yet it gets $71 million. We have 9,971 students, and our proposed budget for this year is 53.8 million. And you'll see why that word proposed is gonna come into effect in a few more slides I'm gonna have Director Borthwick talk about. But this, uh, this per pupil funding formula, as it stands right now, I know that we're second from the bottom, but that's not where we rank money-wise. We actually rank dead last. So for all the school districts that have over 7,000 students that are urban districts, uh, Bethlehem isn't in here because Bethlehem is a regional district. They usually fall right under us population-wise, but they also fall in two counties. The city falls in two counties, Northampton and Lehigh. So they're a very different district than us. But when you talk about urban school districts and where we fall for the per pupil funding formula, I have to give uh, Governor Wolf some credit, although I do agree with Sandra, I wish the effort was a little bit more proactive, but he has funneled money to, toward our district slowly, and I think this is something that will hopefully happen on a recurrent basis. This is the bare minimum we need, and we could use a lot more, and you'll see that in the next slides coming up with uh, Mr. Roper. All right, so um, as Director Duffy said, you know, when you're looking at the dollar amount here, this is a proposed budget. So this hasn't actually passed. Um, I believe last year uh, the, the state budget passed on time July, by July 1st. Uh, sometimes in past years that's not the case. But the proposed per pupil funding for 1920 is $5,402 per kid. That's what a kid in Scranton is going to be worth to the state if we pass this budget. But no, on the bottom there, it says 10.5 million of this amount uh, it was one-time funding, but without it, it would be 4350 That's what we get now as part of our basic education subsidy. So we're dead last in terms of urban school district funding with the $4,350, and even with this $10.5 million, if it recurs year after year and it gets approved, we're still actually dead last. So even with a boost, we're on the bottom. Uh, and so if you, if you do the math, we're being shorted, it says on the bottom there, approximately $18.9 million per year. You would not have to worry about conversations about closing buildings, or cutting programs, or eliminating librarians, or cutting jobs. Uh, none of that would ever happen if we were getting $18.9 million per year. And that just brings us to the average. So, Director Duffy pointed out that York gets $9,000 per student. Well, we're not even asking for $9,000 per student. We're just asking to be average. And that, and to get us to the average, we need $18.9 million per year. Um, and if you look, uh, so the proposed budget, we get $10 million more dollars between eight, you know, 1819 to 1920. So we are getting more money, but, but that's still not nearly enough to give us, and we're not even asking for a bailout, we're just talking about Give us what, what we're due. Give us what Scranton kids deserve. Um, you know, just asking to be, you know, staying in dead last is just not enough. And so, um, if you look at the bottom again, it says we need a permanent solution to a permanent problem. That's why we're all here. That's why all of you came out tonight. That's why um, my fellow directors and I have been going to board meetings, uh, or excuse me, PTA meetings, to take this to uh, parents who are directly affected by everything that's going on. I didn't know about this until Director Duffy brought it to my attention. Uh, and, and a lot of us probably could say the same things. That, that this, this is the number one issue facing the Scranton School District. And the only way we're gonna get that solution is with all of us working together. Um, the, for example, the, the, the petition uh, that we talked about at the rally, 
uh, that Michelle Dempsey over at the Prescott PTA started. Those are the kinds of things that, that get the attention of our elected officials, because they're the ones who are going to make the decision about whether or not we're going to get this money. And so, like I said, what can you do? You can contact your legislators. There's a long list here, and we'll provide that information to anybody who wants it, but getting in touch with your state representatives, your state senators, and not just the ones that are uh, representing us here in Scranton, because we have two state reps and one state senator, and there are a whole lot more uh, in Harrisburg that, that we need to reach out to. We need to get in touch with the power players down there. We need to get in touch with the governor. We need to let them know that Scranton kids are worth just as much as any other kid in the state of Pennsylvania. And so activism, like I said, activism is what matters and activism is what works. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. I'm going to toss it back to the here. Thank you. And, and again, thank everyone for coming out. And we just kind of started to tighten up this a little bit more. Uh, and I, I know she wouldn't want credit, but I have to give her credit anyways. Uh, Ro Hume has helped out with uh, kind of narrowing down who we should call, and we want to stay in line with what PA School Works does, and they want to kind of devise a Northeast coalition. And I think that that's a great idea, uh, but I have passed out uh, maybe about two dozen of these, but there's another dozen or so up here. This basically has uh, the list of the Senate majority leaders, the Senate minority leaders, um, the Republicans and Democratic leaders in the House that we should actually be calling. I think, I have to say, um, Senator Blake and Representative Marty Flynn have been absolutely fantastic working on this effort. Uh, I know that Director Mullins is, or uh, Director Mullins, Representative Mullins is re relatively new, but he worked for Senator Blake for a long time. He's very well up to speed on what is going on and what needs to be done, and I think we have a friend in him too. But the two things that we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that we get this money, this $10.5 million, and that that number doesn't change. And secondarily, like my partner just said, um, we want to make sure that this funding continues forever. We can't just get away with a one-time fix. Two years ago, they gave us $2 million, and there was a few board members that, when I said this a few years ago, they actually laughed. They said that the state's not coming in. And we wound up getting $2 million. And then last year, we did get an additional $6 million. But they were one-time funding articles from other spots that aren't specifically the basic education funding line item. We want that line item to continue to increase. We want it to stay increased because I, I don't want to speak for Dr. Finan, but I think if we continue to get more money, there's a lot much uh, that we can do to make sure that some of these things aren't as harsh and some of these things don't have to happen. I'm not in favor of closing schools and making things smaller when our population is growing, and we have to maintain uh, you know, a proper funding and adequate funding for everyone throughout the state of Pennsylvania. But I think our kids need it more so than anyone. That fair funding law that came into effect in 2016 had a clause in it that was called a whole harmless clause. So they, they, they realized that the way they funded our school districts needed to be changed, and they did that. They did not allow us to retroactively go back, which is where some of the lawsuit stems from, and allow us to get the money that we need right now. They wanted to do it over maybe a 20 or 30 year incremental course and funnel more of the money through the funding formula. I, too, agree with the funding formula, but we can't wait for that to happen, obviously. We need to make sure that these changes start now. I want to thank every single one of my directors for being here tonight. Mr. Popel has got, come to numerous meetings. Mr. Borthwick's come to numerous meetings, and I believe everyone up here has been at least to one PTA meeting. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Dixon has been to plenty of them. But everyone up here has been to PTA meetings and have been up here fighting with us together for fair funding. And most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you because without the action of Mrs. Boland tonight getting this rally together, uh, Michelle Dempsey getting the, P the, the um, petition started, and some of the PTA moms here getting the bus trip started, I think we're starting to make really good grounds forward and letting people know that we're not sleeping on this issue anymore. So thank you to all of you who have been involved, all the conversations that I've had. Mr. Inez, thank you for uh, bringing this to some of your groups that are working proactively. So thank all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you for listening to us. And we're going to open this up to kind of a back, back and forth questionnaire. Does anyone have any questions or anything that they'd like to talk about specifically? I would like to say something. So sure. I just want to let it be clear that Dr. Feynman's role as the Chief Recovery Officer and uh, the Recovery Committee their job is, is not to get us more funding. Um, their decisions are made, but my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, okay, say the plan's put in place, it can be amended. 
Could it be amended by the increase of funding? Absolutely. So these are two different things we have to work on. And I know people keep come up to me and say, well, what can I do? So this sheet of Senate majority leaders and, um, and parlaying with, with the letter templates, because some people say, what can I do? I'm not good at writing letters. So we have a template. You know what? And where do I write them? Where do I send them? You send them to these people. So uh, I just think we have some resources together now that, we can, you know, of course we can move forward. But remember again that once, you know, if the plan is not written in stone, it can be amended, and especially if we get a, a better influx of funding. Could I, I, I'd like to follow up. I've had some questions come to me in discussions at PTA meetings and outside of PTA meetings where people asked, I think it was even mentioned in, in an editorial at one time about suing the state to get an equitable education. I remember reading something about this when I was campaigning, Mr. Audi. Maybe you can fill us in a little bit more, if, maybe if not tonight, update us at our, our work session. To my understanding, there's been several lawsuits that have been filed with the state. However, there is a lawsuit known as the William Penn District versus PDE that was filed in 2014 that got further than any other one has, and they're scheduled to go to trial in the summer of 2020. I'm understanding that there's six districts involved in that, and I don't know, we don't have money to sue, but if that does go to trial and it's founded to change things, we would benefit from that, correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. want to really just address that because I that comes up a great deal yeah um, the uh, historically a majority of the states in the United States that have had huge success in changing their funding have done it through the judicial route so often what happens is school districts file a lawsuit against their uh, the legislators the legislators that are forced by the judges to come up with this extra funding but it takes years and years to do um, Every time that we have filed previously, the previous sets of series of lawsuits failed because there weren't standards. When they put the new uh, standards into place, as well as the funding formula, there is now actually a mechanism based on um, the criteria for the judicial people to review how a school is funded and how successful they are. The language says adequate. <laughs> And there's, um, it was, un, it was no way to measure was what the previous judicial argument had been. So now that we actually have standards, I know Common Core and PA Core, whatever you want to call it, um, it at least gives a, a, a framework now for a review of this process. But let's be realistic. Um, it is a, a Panther Valley is this one of the school districts. There's a whole series of school districts, William Penn in Philadelphia, were instrumental, and their parents are actually very involved in how this happened. This still will take a very long time to happen. This is not something that is anywhere near um, um, nearly done just to hear the oral arguments. Um, so really, um, I, would, I would behoove anyone um, to look at this as a positive that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case, uh, but not to see it as the cure for what's going to occur here. And it's important for advocates to work um, towards funding in another way. Um, Obviously, if there's some kind of miraculous, you know, change in how the pace works, um, it could be quick. Uh, but it took years just to get them to agree to hear the case. <laughs> yeah, this was filed in 2014. Correct. That's my point. Literally years. And I know that there's a change in the, in the Supreme Court. There's a whole lot of factors that are involved. But it's important for us to realize that we need to work towards funding as um, advocates and not rely on the judicial process to Correct. mandate how we fund schools. That was my point. It took so long to get through the process. And then from what I read in that article in December, they said it, they have until February of 2020 to make a summary judgment to even see if there's enough to go forward. Am I correct? You're correct. And as you know, um, sometimes when it's a very hot issue and it involves uh, matters outside the court's jurisdiction, they could sit on it for quite a while as right. well. So I agree that we should not be waiting on that decision to correct the problem. Correct. Very good. Anyone else? Just you?
Just very briefly, with the list of addresses that were sent out there, political activists normally don't win the please nicest with others award. You might think that your, own, your voice is only one voice. If you ring the officers or you work for them, they, they work on the theory that for every person who rings, or calls, sorry, everyone who calls their office, there are a hundred people sitting at home who haven't bothered to call. So don't think, oh, what's one phone call going to do? Or what's one letter going to do? It is amplified beyond anything you could believe. If everybody in this room rang every, or called, sorry, called every one of those officers on that piece of paper, they would go, what's going on in Scranton? There must be thousands of people in Scranton. So please, don't just think my voice doesn't count. Amplify. Thank you very much again. We do, have a, we do have a continued list up here. Like I said, we want to coordinate the effort with the Northeast delegation so we have more of a coordinated effort in asking for more. However, I think some of these leaders that are uh, on the back of this paper are going to be very important to making the decision and making sure that that number there does not change. Mr. Outstanding. That was uh, Ms. Bull, and she said she's going to make it available to all of her members, and I think it's a great idea that we do the same thing. One of the things that I was most uh, excited about is a lot of times we do disagree on a, a lot of efforts that are going on, but this one we're see, we seem to be exactly on the same page. And for the first time, this PowerPoint presentation was put out on the same day with the uh, teachers on Facebook, uh, their actual committee and our Facebook committee posted at the same day, same time. So it shows that we're starting to work together and people are understanding this problem. And when we work together, we will be effective. People will hear what we're trying to say. And I'm telling you, we're gonna get this money if we can keep this push moving forward. And not only just today through July 1st, but continuing forward until we get what every single kid in our district deserves, what every stakeholder and what every parent and teacher deserves. And that's fair funding for our kids and for everybody else. Susan Specka from Ed Voters PA is working with me um, for the PA Schools Work Northeast. So also um, you can reach out to her and, and she's giving great support for all of us. Um, but I wanted to remind you, many people that um, work in Scranton School District, and she was one of the first persons that pointed this out, um, you don't necessarily live in the city of Scranton. So your personal representative also should hear from you. Um, and it's important that you do that because they realize the, as an employer, your strength um, is also there. Not just the residents of your school district, but as an employer, um, your school district is strong in the Northeast Corridor and it's important for them to support the school district because it also helps support the members that are living in their own districts as well. I've literally almost worn her card out. She's been amazingly helpful. Her number is 717-331-4033. She's with Pennsylvania Education Voters. Very influential in getting me most of the information for this PowerPoint along with PDE. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I teach the kids this. When, you know, it comes to environmental movements and it comes to any social Justice movement, uh, all the social scientists say that if you can get five, just five to 10% of people uh, who are stakeholders involved, that everybody else will fall in line. That, you know, none of, none of the uh, great changes have come from the top down you know, when it comes to this. It comes from grassroots movements, five to 10% of the people, and everybody else will move. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kids. Anyone else? Outstanding. All right. Thank you again for coming out. This can conclude. This concludes the uh, my portion of the meeting. We're, we have a, a few more policy meetings and uh, committee meetings that are going to continue on. You guys are more than welcome to stay. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Believe me. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>
I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? All of them. The eyes out. I will. I know. I'm terribly offended. Uh, I will call the policy committee meeting to order. We just have a few things to address this evening. Uh, the first thing, let me get my correct folder out here, pardon me. The first being the board vacancy, uh, just to address the issue of taxes. I've spoken with Mr. Audi about this. I believe, based on some of the other information I've read, you'll see um, policy 004 membership on your agenda next. Uh, that is just for reference because it does indicate um, on page three of that document, number five under qualifications, shall file a statement of financial interest with the board secretary or designee at the following times before taking the oath of office or entering upon his or her duties. So it would seem to me that we might be able to include in the vacancy, uh, the filling of board vacancy 004BOG1, board operating guideline, that in addition to submission of applications, resumes, and letters of interest, we might be able to also include the statement of financial interest as part of that packet. This is um, page one, okay. zero, zero, 004, yes, so you're down here in the paragraph that begins when a board vacancy occurs. So if that's something that Mr. Audi believes is allowable yes. and everyone is in agreement, Mr. Gentileza, perhaps we can add that to that document. Um, also, I, I don't see where you're talking. Oh, I'm sorry. In the um, 004 BOG1, yes. the paragraph that begins when a board vacancy occurs, <laughs> the second sentence says the board will set a deadline for submissions of, for submission of applications, resumes, and letters of interest. I would recommend that that, also, that list also include the statement of financial interest that we all file as candidates when we file our petitions and then annually as elected officials. So as member, now, was that on membership, Kate? That, it is referenced on membership. That's why I asked that that be available tonight because... Oh, but you don't want it you're not asking for the change on membership, you're asking for it on 004 BOG. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep, that that be included in that list. And I just ask that 004 membership be available um, on account of that being referenced there before taking the oath of office or entering upon his or her duties. Because I think there was a, an understanding that someone appointed to fill a vacancy would have 10 days to submit this, when in fact it seems as though that might be the case if we voted on one night and then this person took the oath of office at a subsequent meeting, but as we seem to be doing it all at the same time, I would think that that document should be provided with the application and letters of interest and resume. Um, the other point I'd like to raise with that document is in, and I don't have this available for everyone, I apologize, but on our policy 610, copy of, or not copy of, that's the draft I have, purchase is subject to bid quotation. We did, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the date of this was, I think uh, June 25th, 2018, so last summer, we did amend that policy to include a line, all contracts will state that all applicable school district taxes must be paid or in the dispute or appeal process. Delinquencies will be addressed as outlined in policy 606 and AR 606-0. Perhaps that can be, I don't know that that would belong in filling a board vacancy, perhaps it belongs in membership. I think that's something I, I might need Mr. Audi's advice on and we can work with Mr. Gentileza to then present this as a 
change at the work session? Absolutely. I think off the top of my head right now, I think it would more appropriately be on the membership as okay. opposed to. That, okay. Very good. And then the other, so if there are no other, the other thing I did want to um, share the, this is here, the application form. Um, has that by people. We did in our last revision of the um, vacancy policy add the question district policy to our list of questions that we may ask. District policy 304.1 nepotism requires that a candidate for a full-time position shall disclose but will not be disqualified by any relationship with the current director or superintendent. And the question then, do you have a personal or professional relationship with any director or member of the administration or are any members of your immediate family employed by the district? In looking at these things today, I did wonder if that is, if we should be amending this application to include a question like that, and perhaps this is a, a place where we could also address the, you know, do we have check boxes of, I filled out the financial interest statement, or the, my taxes are up to date, however is appropriate to handle that, but I, I am wondering if at this point our application other than do you have children currently enrolled in the district have you ever had children enrolled in the district do you serve on any district or school committees it's almost a reiteration of a resume and a letter of interest hey, we we don't know where you are oh i'm on zero six uh i'm on zero zero four bog two you're still on that's zero. the application that i asked for this yeah, afternoon we have that but we don't know where you're oh, I'm in your language. I'm from. looking at the nepotism question on 004BOG1. So that's the board vacancy policy. That is a question that we added in our last revision. And I am just wondering if we should be looking at instead, or in addition, placing that on the application to disclose any relationships or business relationships. I mean, maybe we really I, I think that is more a legal question. What is allowable to ask? But it's in there. The, the concern I have about it is, is, is a vague definition of what those terms mean. Which we have defined in other policies. Okay. So there are other places where we say this is relative, that, like this is immediate family, this is relative. Okay. So I, I agree with you. I would want to be very careful with that language. Okay. But I think there are places we could reference that. Okay, and we have a policy. It's, it's in the policy where they have to disclose this anyway. It's You just don't want to put it in the application itself? In, in the policy, it is on the list of potential questions that we could ask as we interview a candidate. So that may not be a question that's chosen at that time. I see, okay. I do think it also probably falls in line with the ethics or policy 827. I just feel like there's a lot of crossover here. And this is, this is probably something that you and I need to communicate about yeah. and then present. I just kind of wanted to get everybody's idea, right. get an idea of do you all think this is a good direction to go. Right. The only the only concern that I would that would come to my mind right now is in an application process where we try to become too specific, we end up um, you're always going to miss some question. There's, there's always going to be some issue that comes up that we would not right. um, include in the in the proposal. So uh, we need to talk about it, yeah. but I, I think maybe it would be if if that's an important enough question, then maybe that should just be asked. At, at all the interviews, but I, I'm certainly open to it. And once we make a decision, if it should be in on the application, I'd be happy to issue a legal uh, opinion as to whether or not it's in some way discriminatory. Or when they come to pick up an application, then that policy could accompany the application. Sure. Because sure. your policy carries, carries a lot of weight 
as opposed to the application. So, and I mean, there are places in policy where it very clearly states this does not make you ineligible for this. It is simply information, or we or may like to have. On the application, we can refer them to the policy also. Are most of our policies for employees, not actual uh, directors that, that we're referring to? I'm in favor of adding some, some meat to these applications. Mm -hmm. But I, I, know, I know, like you said, I'm okay also with your legal opinion of, of what we add and what we don't add. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure whatever we add to the application process, because this is a, a, it, it's a, it's a publicly held position, right. Right. that we are not discriminating in any way. Right. Um, it's a little, it, 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 there's a little bit of a differential in my mind. But I'm certainly open to explore that possibility, and we would have to make sure we're not overly broad in our definitions. That's the other issue. Are you comfortable with Attorney Oni exploring possibilities and discussing it at the work session? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, I, absolutely. and I'm very curious to know um, if the board has a specific, um, if, if there is a consensus to be, as, as you said, beefing up the application process. I'm not opposed to that in any way, shape, or form, but the, cons the only concern that it raises that also puts in my mind is if we make the application process almost a code checklist, by its very omission, if it's not in there, then it's gonna be not important because we didn't put it in there. That, so we have, to be, we have to weigh that carefully. That, that's all I'm saying. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. But do we have consensus that we should continue to work on this document and try to strengthen it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. So yes. We'll continue to do that. Absolutely. I'd like to go Katie, we could discuss um, it. Is it possible to, so when you look at some of the questions like what quality standards or experience would you bring to the board, can, can we just say, can you include, because there's no directive to actually include a cover letter and, re, and resume, so that would that, that could certainly files. be, yes. And then we could possibly maybe add a guideline document, like these are things you need to consider, or you know, these are maybe things that you want to include in your cover letter, yeah. um, just to help give us more information. Yeah. Okay. That's, a, that's a definite yeah. option, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'm comfortable with this more. Okay. Uh, then we can move to policy 006, which is meetings, and I just wanted to discuss uh, several times we've talked about the timing of our meetings and the fact that we don't meet regularly in July, August, or January. Um, I do understand that policy 006 and school code, I believe, dictate that um, we board meetings shall be public and shall be held at specified places at least once every two months. So we are well beyond our quota there. Um, I certainly am of the opinion that at least an August meeting would be helpful. I do, and I you know, certainly don't want to, I, I understand there's a lot that goes into opening a school district for the, the start of school each year and certainly wouldn't want to put unnecessary pressure on the administration, but I do feel as though in September, you know, we're, we're preparing for that work session right at the end of August, we're hitting the ground running in September, and perhaps if we we're able to split some of those agenda items and, and walk them back a bit to an August meeting that that might be helpful. I think um, we do call August meetings. We did last year. Um, to, because we have last minute uh, items that we need the board to approve before we proceed with the opening of school. It usually is based around personnel mm -hmm. and some other issues. So. We call special meetings uh, through the month of August, and if I recall, ever since I've been here, we've had an August meeting. So it's not on, on your agenda, but we do we do ask for that. So, I mean, perhaps if everyone is in agreement, it wouldn't be bad to put it on the agenda, put it on the calendar. The only place that I see the August meeting, July, August, and January reference is in the book of rules. So if it could just be omitted from there, then it would go on our schedule and we'd know to anticipate it. I think the August meeting too is dependent on central administration because opening 
the, the schools for the upcoming school year is quite an undertaking. And I, I, I'm hesitant about scheduling it like on our normal schedule, like we have it on that, the certain Monday of the month. You might not be ready the first Monday of the month, but you need us the third Monday right. of the month. I think subject that to the only. That, that would be my concern Caution. about putting it in there. I mean, we have it anyway. Can we just do it on an as-needed basis? Yeah, that's what we possible? are doing now, Mr. Boardwood. I, I do want to say, I, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but going out to meet the public at these PTA meetings has been probably one of the most rewarding experiences that I have felt since becoming a board member. I mean, we all became board members to advocate for kids. and just going out and having discussions with the people that elected us to be in office and talk about different issues that people want answers to in a different type or a more relaxed type of forum, I think has been a great experience. And I'd like to see that continue happening um, in the upcoming year. Not all in one month like we did. <laughs> um, and never home, none of us are home this month, but. I think that's a practice that maybe we should consider as a board over the course of the year. I agree. I think the, the meetings that we've held with the, uh, with the PTA members uh, have, have, been, have, have been fantastic. Uh, there have been ideas changed. Uh, I've learned things. I believe the PTA uh, people have learned things. And uh, utilizing the PTA the way we are, the way we have done it this time, uh, to, to support the uh, uh, fair funding initiative is going to be a, 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 a resounding success and I agree the more that we get out to these districts or to these schools and interact with them I think the better off the entire system will be and I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more than that. I don't know anybody else? I, I'm so, for that. We can, so like, is, is, there, is there a way to go? The discussion at hand is about uh, the August meeting. Oh, yeah, we can finish that by <laughs> Well, we have we, we have heard we heard from the superintendent. We have had August meetings, and uh, because of the fact that the, super, the front office, the central office is really busy with the opening of schools, I think we should leave it the way it is now. If we need a meeting, we can have it. We've had them in the past, and rather than rather than burden the uh, uh, the central office with the uh, preparing for a meeting, uh, let's just float it the way we go and. Uh, I think, I think we should leave it the way it is. So that's, I mean, that's, leave it at this. I, that seems to be the consensus of the consensus. So I think consensus. there we are. OK. Um, and could, and then, could we take could we take the time to visit that PTA? Well, I don't know when the appropriate time. Would be. Well, if, I think it was a few months ago at a um, public relations meeting when I, I did when this conversation began. Um, I certainly am in favor of that, and I'm, I'm happy to see it getting a little more traction. I, I remember having a discussion where we talked about it. It would be great if we could get out to the PTAs, and I, I think you and I have had this conversation. I've always thought it would be wonderful if among the nine of us, we could kind of split up the schools and, you know, no, oh, I pay attention to the calendar of West Intermediate and you pay attention to the calendar of Northeast and I pick up the phone and call Mark and say, there's a play over here. I mean, I, I would really love to see that discussed and, and mapped out. I, I think hey, that would yeah, be fantastic. Actually, I remember having a great conversation yeah. with you. We yeah. talked about that last year. Yeah, actually, Director Gil Martin suggested putting together a school calendar of all the Right. The different schools to, to make available for the right. to, to, to attend again. I think that's great. I, mean, I, I, I try to keep up as much on Facebook as I can. There's a lot of information shared there. But I, I certainly think if we could create some central central calendar that we can, it's, it would be wonderful. Right. Whether we can receive information from the principals, if we can just be copied on whatever monthly announcements they send out or however if however you go, best to if deal you with go to the school websites all of their information right. is on their school website 
So if you divide the schools mm -hmm. as you're talking about it, and you just keep up with their website, you'll see all their events uh, listed by by calendar day. All, all of the schools. So well, that, maybe I'll I'll work out a little map right. between the nine of us. You know, at least get a pair of people or or, or three of us that are keeping an eye on all of those things, and we can create a Google calendar or something. I agree because I agree because sometimes the only time we hear about the good things the students are doing are from student reps at a meeting. Right. All right, and, and most of the time it's stuff they've already done, not what's coming up. Right. Well, here, uh, you know, there might be a play coming up. We always know there's a play from each high school every year, but beyond that, we're not in the know of all that. But okay, so we can we can check every school district website, but why can't on on, on the district website we have a calendar that reflects all the different pieces that are going on, for not just for not just for us, but for the people who just check the the, the Scranton school district. Calendar. Facebook, I'm sorry, website. Uh, if we, that's a great idea, and staffing is always an issue. If we could do what we all have said would be great and have a director of communications in the district, that would pretty much be fabulous. We have kids making windmills. That's a beautiful, hands-on, active learning project. I believe we can get a couple kids who could do this project. They're, they're very savvy with technology. I think they can be put to task and actually do that for us. Some class. So Maybe a work call-up program at the high school. Or, or even my school. I mean, we have classes that, that can do this. <clears throat> Some changes we've discussed already. I, I think, Dr. Kieran, you um, had a, a concern about the points going from 50 to 70, and I see that that change was made here. Is there anything you would like to point out? That was a recommendation of our uh, human resource directors. Okay. Uh, they said that was something that definitely should be uh, raised. Okay, and so, that would be on, pardon me, on page two, under interview guidelines, maximum of 100 points for interview. Under the first interview scoring, all candidates earning 70 points and above in the oral interview shall move to the second round of interviews. Am I correct there? Yes. Previously it had yes. said 50. 50. Mm -hmm. um, I did notice one small error here on the first page under first interview uh, the second point sft appointed teacher with experience i think we can omit at the level of the open position or that was my lang suggested language i was saying it could be worded this way or that way i think the sentence can simply read sft appointed teacher with experience at the level of the position for which the interview is being conducted. That language appears several more times throughout mm -hmm. the document. So that so just omitting at the level of the open mm -hmm. position four would make that consistent. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then only other very insignificant thing I noticed um, the ancillary scoring, the second to last bullet point, a writing sample will be scored by the superintendent or the most senior staff member. Instead of simply saying the member shall leave the interview room, I would suggest the superintendent or senior staff member shall leave the room. <coughs> it is nitpicking to the nth degree, I know, but when I read it, I thought, no, who's, who's leaving? And I think if we just clarify that by saying 
the superintendent or a senior staff member. Shall we be interviewed? That would be more clear. Does anyone have any questions? Or yeah, I still, I still don't like to mention before that the, the essay at the end, the writing sample. I think the whole process is done, the rubrics are done, and then now this person can get extra points based on one person's uh, perspective and the whole panel. Do you have a concern about the number of points or? Well, I could tip the scales for, for. So if, if perhaps it was a little percentage. I think the rubrics percentage. should be, the score should lie with it. I, I have a question. I don't remember if I asked this last year. I honestly don't. I'm just going back to my days. But SFT appointed teacher for an administrative interview. That always hasn't been the case. When did that start? Maybe Rose can answer me. When did that start? When this, when this, uh, this, was done in 2013, this policy, and that's when it was added. That just jumped out on me. I, I, I can't see. Do, do we have any best practices with that? I mean, I know when I was in touch with PSBA trying to research all of this information, this is more comprehensive than what a lot of other districts do. This is, a lot of other districts don't seem to have these, and I, I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah. Would it be appropriate to ask Dr. Finan? Yes. <laughs> Would it be appropriate to ask her your experience on an interview panel? I'd like to address that uh, part about tipping the scales. When the, uh, most of you've been through the process already, so you understand when the writing sample is being uh, reviewed. There's no indication whatsoever of what candidate has how many points. So the writing sample is taken at face value for certain uh, items that you're looking for uh, comprehensively in the answer. So there's no <coughs> indication of points that have been distributed yet. The team is sitting in, in the room and the points are being discussed. The writing sample is being reviewed outside of that room and has, there's no indication whatsoever of what points are, be, are being discussed in the room. Then when the writing sample comes in, that score is added to each individual's score and, and a conversation about what was looked for in the sample is reviewed to the team. So I, I don't think it tips in any way or influences uh, the score in any way. Uh, I, I think it does because... I just 
just asked a question because it jumped well, out I, at me. What I'm saying is we're prepared to withdraw. And the reason we're prepared to withdraw is exactly the topic of the discussion here for about three months now. So uh, whatever your decision is, we will withdraw if, if, if the scoring mechanism isn't this is fair to everyone. Right. So uh, and this, this, this was the reason. Highest, lowest, all these other marking things. I, I'm a math person. Give me five numbers, I'll divide by five to get an average. I don't think anything needs to be thrown in or out or anything. But whatever your decision is, it is. If it's not going to be a fair process, I will withdraw the union from it. I'm not participating in this anymore because it's, it's getting to be a, a very serious point of contention in my in my own. So the, the writing evaluation is your specific point of contention? Or is there more than Director Gomart, you said that PSBA has um, talked to you or, or yes. about this. Is there uh, do they have a policy specifically that would No. Oh no. they don't. No, that's that's the problem. They're really this is very different from way things are handled in any other district. So, is there something they could give us that like from another district that might be the model district, like the best practices elsewhere that we could follow? It doesn't exist. Oh, I, I don't believe, um, part of my interruption, I just don't believe that I work closely with PSBA and I know they don't have, uh, they will not weigh in on that, they don't have a model policy and they wouldn't suggest one. But they will they will share examples from they, other districts. They certainly you know, would share off and, if, if they have they'll, 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 but they that's the problem with these if, all of the hiring mm -hmm. policies. They are not handled like this in other districts. And many and many administrative hiring policies are not even laid out in writing, frankly, uh, in many of the districts that I represent. Some are, some are not, but um, I would agree with Dr. Finan that it, it, it's a complicated process. There's no doubt about it. Can we get some proposals and maybe a recommendation? Yeah, I just I don't know where to look for the. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. I, I'd like to make a comment because mm -hmm. I mean I'm listening to the discussion and what we're talking about. I mean, as we speak this evening, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission is a case of them. Uh, doing a public hearing on hiring practices for the uh, Mary School District. Um, it falls back onto these very same challenges that the hiring process um, either creates a, a disparate impact type discrimination or it's just blatant. Um, uh, so the School District, uh, as in the, excuse me, in the paper, that it lacks diversity. And in the conversation I'm listening to, I, I'm not hearing to take that into consideration. Um, so it, 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 taking it into consideration probably means making it that much less complicated. Uh, you know, uh, because a lot of these issues, um, they always go right back to the, what, what the commission is hearing right now is we can't buy qualified ones. You know, whatever that means. The Every Student Succeeds Act had a, a lot of, of law into the, the state plan, and a lot of law that provided guidance um, because it is the Every Student Succeeds Act, you know, it's an extension of the Elementary Secretary uh, Education Act uh, that is a, 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 a civil rights legislation. And as I mentioned at the meeting, the meaning that it's Title I and all our title funding is dependent upon that. So the conversation <coughs> ought to be informed by those laws. Um, so making it more complicated, uh, it makes it more difficult to defend. <laughs> because the, the, I, I'll tell you, the Scranton the, 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 the Human Relations Commission, we, you know, we have to give these cases for employees, not for the students, but for employees. And um, even issues of sexual harassment, issues of, of, uh, uh, of employment, and uh, this this thing is it's a movement in the state, you know, it's a movement in the state, and, um, and these urban these urban cities that are having so many problems uh, are 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 in focus. They're they're they're, they're focusing 
sometimes urban cities where there's so many problems uh, and it just perpetuates, you know, all the corruption or whatever it is perpetuates the discrimination and it keeps poor people in poverty. You know, it keeps communities divided along racial lines. You know. So, back to what Barbara was saying, is that uh, it, it needs to be informed by the law. Yeah, every Two Succeeds Act, Pennsylvania New Relations um, Act, and even the Scranton Ordinance, because a lot of people don't know that it, it, um, that the Scranton Ordinance, we, you know, two years ago it was ratified, it was redone, um, uh, uh, gender identity is included in, in the ordinance in the city of Scranton, which is not in, in the state or in federal government. So those are the types of things that have to be informed that inform those types of decisions, you know, okay, so you don't waste your time. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's good learning, and, it, and it, 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 you, you'll find out that every one of these issues, they feed into a different funding source that, that, that'll get you out of, out of trouble. <laughs> you know, it really does, you know, for the, for the, for the kids. You know, uh, it's normal that when there's, you know, in economics, when there's not enough money, everybody wants to hold on to what little they have, what do with my child? This, that paradigm has to shift, but it has to be that whatever we're doing has nothing to do with taking anything away from anybody. It is equitably, equitably assuring that everybody gets what their fair share is, you know, in the community that they pay taxes to. So I just wanted to help with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Gilmartin, if I can make a suggestion. You know, everyone does not have the policy in front of them, and everyone in this room who's commenting has not really read the policy. Can you consider getting a small uh, group together to maybe start from scratch on an administrative hiring policy, and then bring that forward to get feedback from the rest of the board? This was done, Mr. McAndrew, I wasn't here in 2013, but I believe you were. Can you give us any history on the... Well, I, I, the, this was, I, I brought up this point like a year ago, actually, when we first started to make the change. This, this was the reason that this that the process stopped. It stopped because we were having a dialogue and we got nowhere. And now, what is the second read? I mean, I didn't write the policy or change the policy. But we've had a couple meetings discussing this policy, and I voiced my same opinion about what I want to see changed or omitted. But this policy's been in effect since 2013. 13, 14, I'm not sure, but. Well, it wasn't when I, I came, and I I know it's it's been a policy that had recently been developed, but I'm, I'm thinking the best way to attack this is to get a small group together like you've done before and look at some sample policies and see what might be best for Scranton and with what's within the law. Have Mr. Audi review it, bring it to the board and get their feedback on it at that point. I agree that the consensus here is that this is not appropriate and we, we do need to start yeah. from scratch. Yeah. And that's, now this was and, one of those policies that we looked at in a small group. It was. It was. We usually we get to this. Yeah, I remember this time we didn't finish. And yeah. Everybody has ants in their pants. Yeah. So this should probably be the only one on the table <laughs> when when that small group meets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think because I, mean, I think we've picked it apart and put it back together and picked it apart and, and it's uh, we're hearing from Miss Bolin. We're hearing from. Mr. Agnes, we're hearing from Dr. Fina, we're hearing from all of the board members, so I think it's worthy of a separate meeting just to get maybe start from scratch with a new policy that may not be as complicated. Right. Um, right. I, I'm absolutely in favor of that. Well, I, mean, I guess we are, we are at a meeting right now. With Ms. Bowen, was there anything uh, when it comes to the makeup of the interview panels that Yes, SFT disagree with? Uh, we, we have the makeup of two.
conversation that we need to have on, an, on a, another evening. I just want to say this so it comes out of my mouth and doesn't get lost in my brain. If if the writing sample is, which I mean, I, I certainly think there's value to that. Having had this experience, I think just that format can give somebody an opportunity to convey how they would handle a situation. Could we perhaps consider having that available to everyone and just making it one of the pieces that gets scored just like all of the other things. I, mean, that, I think we're getting very detailed in all of this. That's a cover letter. That's, that's a cover letter. That's a cover letter. If you're, talking, so, if you're no. speaking to a certain area that you're going to be working in uh, and, and helping yourself with your abilities and your skill set, that's, that's part of the cover letter. But I mean, I understand the point of a very specific question. Yeah. And if we all had the opportunity to assess the content of that response, maybe that's maybe there's some compromise to be had there. But, but I, I don't want to <laughs> say that um, in most applications, that Mr. Davis said, if the cover letter is part of the package as well as the, um, the application itself, which generally is a fairly specific, not content specific, fairly specific question. Dr. Finan, it does help in a way. 
um, because we're taking that comprehensive question at the interview time, the time the person comes for the interview. Before they come into the interview room, they're asked to answer this comprehensive question. I'm familiar about what you're speaking of, that the question accompanies the application. And then uh, all of the people on the uh, panel would get a copy of the resume along with the answers to the, the answer to the question, the comprehensive question. So you're putting it before, we're looking at it after, so that does make sense. The, the thing that would have to be, I think, um, looked at is what specific items are you looking for in the answer to that question. So for example, if someone is interviewing to be the uh, Chief Human Resources Officer and you want to know comprehensively how they would implement their program, there are certain things that you're looking for in a human uh, uh, resources program. If those things are missing, how does all of the panel members, how does each one know? So there would have to be uh, something to accompany that question to let the whole panel know, these are the things you should be looking for. If they're included in the answer, then you know you've got someone who understands the work. If it's not included in there, and they're very vague, then you know they don't understand the recruiting, the, re the, the retention, the educating, all of that. So not everybody knows that on a panel. For each individual division, so to speak, of a school district. So we have to give a guideline for that. Yes, we do. And when the, yeah, the, uh, after the essay is, is scored and, and I come back in the room, I say to the panel, these are the things that we're look, we were looking for, and I go through each one and say, this one had all of the components, this one didn't, this one missed that, this one didn't. So yes, there is that part of it. Yeah, but that's after all the rubrics are tallied from the panel. But, but the person who, whether it's me or someone else, who marked that essay, has no idea what those tallied scores are because they're out of the room. Do you remember that, pro the process? Yes, I, I mean, I okay. understand what you're saying. That you, yeah. that person would not know, oh, this person needs five more points. I mean, right, I, I have that. no so, idea. Right. Yeah, but, but you're the one who's on the panel and scores the essay. So you know that they don't know. No, I have no idea what you scored or Katie scored or Dr. Feynman scored. Right. Right. I have no idea of the extra, the ancillary points that they get. I, I know nothing about that because you're all talking about that while I'm out of the room. Yeah, but you already scored. You, you already presented your scores of the candidate because you're part of the second round process. Yeah. That's I, I gave my scores, I put them on the table. Right, you, you've completed but, a rubric. But I know nothing of the other scores. I know no one else's score. I know none of the points someone received additional to the scoring. I know nothing. I just come in the room and say this is what, you know, the essays look like. Do we just agree to start from scratch anyway? Yes. I think so. Oh, okay. I think that's the just... best way. <laughs> yes. yeah. Because I think Rosemary had a point in 2013. This was pulled together. Uh, it's been tried all these years. It's been tweaked and retweaked this go around. And it probably should, you probably should have a different process at this point. 
<laughs> that seems to be the consensus. That's what we will do. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's all I have. I'll make a motion to return. Second. Second.